This book's just full of great stories. Well, as you all know, tonight is Super Bowl 54. I've never looked up betting odds on the internet before, but I did this Wednesday. And as of this Wednesday, the Kansas City Chiefs were one-point favorites over the 49ers. No clear favorite tonight. The only sure thing is if you wear red and gold, your team will win. <laughs> I don't believe in praying for God to interfere with the outcome of sporting events, and I don't believe God does interfere in the outcome of sporting events. But if there were a serious underdog, I think there's a chance God might go with the underdog. Because if you ever notice that God has an incredibly lopsided record of choosing people that you and I would never in a million years give a chance. There's a story in the book of Judges of a man named Gideon who is called to lead the army of God. And when God calls Gideon, he's in the threshing floor threshing wheat. Now this is at a time when gendered roles actually mattered. He was doing women's work on the threshing floor when he's called to lead the army. That's, that's a pretty unlikely hero. When Jesus chooses the 12 disciples, he, he gets most of them off of a fishing boat. Now, if I were going to start a movement to change the world, I might go to Dartmouth or Cambridge Probably not the Holiday Marina at Lake Lanier. But Jesus? Don't mistake unlikely for weak, though. God chooses a powerful centurion soldier. The rich and powerful are included in God's purposes, too. But still, a Roman soldier is about as unlikely as a Canaanite woman. And yeah, God chooses a Canaanite woman, too. God chooses a 90-year-old woman named Sarah to birth a nation. And God chooses a teenage girl from nowhere, Nazareth, to birth a Savior. God seldom goes with the favorite. And in today's story, God has whispered for Samuel to go to the home of Jesse because God has chosen Israel's next king from among Jesse's large group of sons. Go tell Jesse that you come in peace, you're here to make sacrifice, ask Jesse and their sons to purify themselves, join you in the holy sacrifice. You will see which one of the sons of Jesse. I'll make clear to you which one is the anointed. So Jesse... Samuel, seven sons makes nine. They head out to the place of sacrifice. And Samuel thinks he has spied the next king of Israel. The boy's name is Eliab. Only he hardly looks like a boy. He looks more like LeBron James of the Lakers. He's big and strong and straight and commanding. And Eliab is king material for sure. And Samuel whispers up to God, found him. Actually, the way he said it is, surely the Lord's anointed is before the Lord. But God says back to Samuel, do not look at his appearance on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord doesn't see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Well, Samuel reviews the whole litter, and there's seven strong, handsome young men, broad-shouldered, full of promise. But the Lord's favor doesn't light on any one of them. Samuel says to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Are, are these your only sons? Yeah, what? what? Well, yeah, I mean, except the youngest, the little one. I mean, he, he's out tending sheep. We'll send for him. We'll all remain on our feet until he gets here. And then there's this other turn in the story set up 
by the line about God not looking at outward appearance. We start to expect a homely little runt, but then we find out he's ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. David would be the next king of Israel. (coughs) Now, I mentioned that God had used an influential Roman soldier, powerful but still unlikely. Here God chooses a handsome king, but not because he's handsome. All of that's irrelevant. He's looking at the heart. But still, David is the most unlikely choice. He is the youngest of all the boys. He's not even grown up enough to be invited to the sacrifice. And still, he's the one chosen to be the king. It's unlikely. But throughout the biblical story and throughout salvation history, God has been working through imperfect and unlikely people to reclaim this broken world through love. Teenaged virgins and Roman soldiers and 90-year-old women and handsome kids. God doesn't use the expected people. God uses available people. God wants all of us to claim our important purpose in this salvation story because everybody in here has some role to play in this good news. I mean, today we're highlighting a big figure in the story, right? The king of Israel. But there are parts all through the Bible of smaller roles. Somebody went and fetched a donkey. That was his job in the story of salvation. Woman went just to grab some water at the well. Next thing you know, she's proclaiming the love of Christ to everybody she sees. God uses available people with loving hearts to play a role in the redemptive story. And it is still true. Today God is still using 90-year-old women and handsome kids and powerful men and prayerful teenagers And you might not feel like you're special. You might not feel like God has claimed you for a special purpose. But God seldom goes with the favorite. God uses the available. You and I line up people by their status and money and looks and title and popularity and address or influence or whatever. God doesn't use that measuring stick. Remember God said to Samuel, don't look at the appearance. I don't look at the appearance. I look at the heart. Beautiful, rich, powerful. If you've got the heart, God wants to use you. Awkward, homely, barely making it. If you've got the heart, God wants to use you. God is using available people with kind hearts to make a difference in a broken world. Unlikely people are heroes throughout the salvation story because they're willing to be used by the Lord to love others into relationship with a living God. I have one more really unlikely story. God so loved the world that he sent a Savior And this time the chosen one was from nowhere Nazareth, born in a feeding trough, son of a carpenter. He blessed women, talked to tax collectors, ate with sinners, healed lepers. He was a king who rode a donkey instead of a war stallion. And he taught that the first will be last and the last will be first. King of kings and Lord of lords, not likely. God doesn't use the likely. God uses the available. And you remember on the final week of Jesus' earthly light, 
we find him in the garden praying what? Not my will, but thine be done. The available with loving hearts. God does not judge on our standards. And later that same week that he offered that prayer, he met with the disciples in an upper room, remember? They were all together for this meal. And he took, this was, it was the night he was betrayed, and he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, in like manner, he took the cup, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then, in a most unlikely part of the story, the next day, Jesus opens the gates to eternal life by a violent death on a cross. How unlikely is that? What should our response be to that kind of love? First, I would encourage you to stop limiting God that in a way that you think God can't use you because you're too unlikely. If God is using teenagers from Nazareth and 90-year-old women and centurion soldiers, there's not one person in this room God is not ready to use for God's great purpose. But it means being available. It means saying, yes, I want thy will be done. So, do you dare? When we come to the table, do you dare offer that prayer? Thy will be done. And how might my imperfect life be used in the great purpose of loving this world back into wholeness? Let's pray together. O oh God, we offer our broken and unworthy lives to the healing of this table. We confess that we have sold ourselves short, believing that only the truly exceptional are called for exceptional purpose. But may we have the courage to come to this table and truly be renewed. Renewed in the forgiveness of sins, but also renewed in our sense of purpose. That we might live for something that matters. That we might be better agents of your grace. Search our heart and judge our heart as we come to this table of life, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
This is the cup of salvation. You might have, you might have prayed that prayer. <coughs> Pardon. <coughs> God, how can I be available, useful, part of your kingdom promise? The next step in that prayer might be relationship with Christ. There may be some in here who have not been to this table and known this life-giving relationship with the living Christ that's always an invitation of this church. The next step for others of you might be membership in this family of faith. Coming up and saying, it's time. It's time that I join my life with yours and get involved in the game and go to work for the cause of Christ. Others of you may have some other very personal <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> first steps that... that <coughs> excuse me, that move you some closer to God's purpose for your life. Whatever that is, if it's appropriate to share publicly, I would welcome the chance to share it on behalf of you to the church. But whether you are public or private, I pray that you will make some decision before leaving today that moves you closer to God's purpose and fulfillment. Let's stand together and sing. <coughs> 